Hello, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to the art as well. Uh, it's this evening instead of this morning because our times have changed uh, to suit a particular um, guest uh, today. But before we start, I want to give a shout out to uh, Eilish de Hueta, who is running a fantastic initiative uh, at the moment on the sale of art. And this initiative is helping out a charity run by a Waterford woman called Anna Rock. And Anne has been on the ground in, on the Turkish-Syria border for a good number of years. But obviously of late, her attention has been turned towards um, the plight of those suffering as a result of the earthquake. And um, this uh, sort of struck a chord with, with Eilish so much so she was wondering how she could help out. And what she's done is she's invited uh, all her followers on Instagram to submit a work uh, which would be sold and the money going directly to Anna O'Rourke's uh, charity, um, which is fantastic, okay? And I'd say in the space of about three days, uh, she has raised over 4,000 euro, which is phenomenal. And those who have contributed so far, and I mentioned them because they featured on the art as well before, um, are the likes of Bridget Flannery, Robert Russell, Pamela Debris, Claire Halpin, and Yvonne Maloney O'Keefe. And I know there are loads more who would like to get involved in, in this. And so if you would, um, please get onto Eilish on our Instagram. If you can't find her, send an email to me and I'll forward it. OK, so it's a really, really good initiative. And indeed, for those of you who aren't artists but are collectors, um, it's a uh, fabulous value for money. There's some really, really wonderful work there at good prices. OK, so please support it if you possibly can. Now to my guest uh, this evening, um, Aideen Barry. Now, Aideen is a member of the RHA, the Royal Hibernian Academy, and also a stoner in recognition of her work in the arts in Ireland. Um, and so we have a lot to cover, I know, with Aideen. So we'll go straight over to uh, Brooklyn, New York, and say hello to Aideen. Hi, Aideen, how are you? Hi, Alan, how are you? It's lovely Great. to you're, see a you're, number you're... of familiar faces in the audience here. So hello, Paul, oh, they're good. Irene, yep. and a couple of other people, Seamus, Kind of see. <laughs> so yeah. it's really nice to see some people I know here. Yeah. Fantastic. And it's great to have you. And, and thank you so much for, for going to the effort of, of being here. Um, but first, I, I, I gather there was a possibility that we might not have had you at all this yeah, evening. Yeah, like literally an hour and a half ago on my way over across town, somebody pulled the emergency brake in the subway and we were all stuck underground for 45 minutes. <laughs> So. <laughs> and without any signal to kind of say, hey, Alan, I'm going to be an hour late or whatever. No, okay. there's no phone reception when you're in the subway, really, unless you're in a station. So, yeah, I was just kind of going, oh, my God, how am I going to work my way out of this quagmire? But I finally got out of the subway and legged it over to the studio. Yeah. You so all. you're nice and relaxed now. All I am. I, I'm sure you can admire my commitment to being here. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. The, the fact that, that you actually gave a bit of, you know, time uh, oh. just in case, you know, the flat tire syndrome and all that. What's that Murphy's law? Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. You sure. Know? Look at how we started out here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Between Alexa misbehaving and all that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. Anyway, listen, tell us about your residency first. What, so is, what is it? How long is it? And how it came about and all that? Um, I mean, it's an uh, amazing thing. It's a kind of a gift, really. Uh, I was given this award by Temple Bar Gallery and Studios. It was an open competition, so anybody could apply. Um, so I put in an, an application last year and Temple Bar Gallery and Studios and the ISCP, which stands for the International Studios and Curatorial Program here in New York. They did a joint panel and selected an Irish winner and I was it. So um, they invited me to be three months here in their studio program. And as part of that program, they invite curators from museums and galleries and foundations in here to do studio visits with you. So that's how that is. So I've, I've been here since January 3rd. I'm here to the end of March in the studio. And then I'm also doing some teaching in Wellesley and Harvard in um, Boston at the same time. So I'm, I'm kind of making the most of my state size side adventures. So, yeah. yeah. And the actual place you're in, is, is are there a series of, of studios there? Or, or... Yeah. yeah, so there's like, at the moment, there's 46 international artists from all over the wow. world. Each one has their own studio space. As well as that, then they, are, they have studio spaces for local New York-based artists that they rent. 
So, yeah. uh, so that's a huge complex in an industrial heartland, heartland of Williamsburg. Um, and the studios are, have been going for nearly 20 years. So, um, and to get a studio in New York is a rare thing because much like what's happening in Dublin, the kind of gentrification, the pushing out of artists, the lack of studio space is a real issue. So this is an, an amazing gift to be really in the capital of visual art production in the world to sure. have this space. So yeah, I, so. I, can, I can well imagine, but what about the other problem of accommodation? Is there a similar uh, so, issue there? Yeah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so what happened was uh, Temple Bar Gallery and Studios gave me a stipend of 18,000 euros. And everybody probably on the other side of this conversation is going, wow, 18,000 euros. And is that tax free? <laughs> uh, it is tax free because you're spending it solely yeah. on the, the award. So, uh, yeah. But the accommodation I've rented is a small studio apartment where the bedroom is in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, for three months, that's 10 grand. And then you're supposed to live on the eight grand here on the food. And the food here is three times the price as it would be at home. So oh, thank, okay. thankfully, the credit union back home in Ireland is helping me out. <laughs> so, and, and we're not jealous anymore at the 18K. No, it doesn't go far. I can tell you that it doesn't go far. <laughs> not at all. And tell me, is, is there a nice social aspect to, to this, given there are so many studios there and... Uh, yeah, we have. So once a month, you have an open studio day where your doors are to be open and you're invited, you're, you meet your fellow compatriots here. And then we also do every Thursday, we go to openings downtown. And then, um, as it turns out, I've become very good friends with an Icelandic artist and a Danish uh curator who's also in residence here so we're kind of like a troika of Europeans going around together kind of analyzing things together and sending tips to each other so that's been fantastic for that yeah. to be honest with you so yeah. yeah it's great and you're like literally you're as an artist you know it's a rare thing to be able to like make your practice but also have critique from other artists from all over the world sure. so you get like, this insight into where does your art sit within a global context. It's kind of really, really a privilege to kind of have that uh, option, you know, to have that yes. feedback, so. Yes, yeah. and tell me something else, because I know you have some children and a partner, yeah. and uh, you know, how are you managing for, for, from that point of view? Are you, are you very lonely there or what? <laughs> uh, no, they're here at the moment for the next the next two weeks. Well, the two smallies, I have three kids, 22, yes. 10 and, and seven. Yeah. Uh, the 22 year old is weird and he's in Cork running a pub and he's just finished um, his course his program and then um, my 10 year old and seven year old are making use of the new um, St Bridget's Day holiday and the midterm break to be here uh, with my partner who I would be lost without who's really holding the fort back home but there I mean the one thing I would say is I get asked this question all the time as a female artist and mm -hmm. I would ask you Alan do you ask this question of male artists do well, do you know what? I, I'm very conscious of that. And I, I, I very carefully said, how are the children managing without you? I did not say that. I know, I, I know. I said, are you lonely? <laughs> In the same <laughs> way as a poor fella children. like me might be lonely if I was away and my children. I know, they are there. lonely, but, but bless them. I mean, like the pandem pandemic gave us this infrastructure. So, yeah. you know, we, we've got Zoom. So I'm doing Zoom homework, Zoom mm. D&D nights, Zoom right. disco in the kitchen back home at Tipperary. So yes. that's fantastic. So that has allowed them to not be too lonely, although they are going to be sad going home on Wednesday. I know it. And I'll imagine. be sad with them going home too. But, you know, it's important imagine. that they see their their mother going out into the world and breaking through glass ceilings. I think that's very important for a family of all males. I think that's very important that they see a, a strong female character. So, yeah. yes, yeah. very good. And home being in uh, Tipperary, I believe, because you're a Cork woman, but. Yeah, so I'm from Mayfield in Cork and we bought a house on the side of the Silvermine Mountains, which I'll yeah. get in a little bit, uh, six oh, years ago. Well, and, from passing by. Yeah, it's beautiful, really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we bought a five bay tractor shed that all of my any money at all that I've left over goes into insulating it and uh, slowly turning it into a kind of a grand design studio project. Mm. So uh, that's, and it's magic. Yeah, it's magic. And yeah. you're all welcome to come visit sometime if you ever want to. So I'd yeah. love to love to. Yeah. Sometime. Um, <clears throat> so t tell us about about your sort of early days in terms of your practice. Were you always doing art, you know, or is that something you've been doing for a young age? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, Did you have a formal life? No, I was always doing art. I always knew I wanted to be an artist, but it was a rare thing to be that when you come from a working class background. There are not um, artists in your community 
that have had that ability to go on and sustain themselves as an artist. So I think my parents were terrified at the prospect that I was going to go not become a nurse or a teacher, but there was no stopping me. I was really gung ho about going to university and becoming an artist. So uh, yeah, I was winning like the credit union. I bring up the credit union a lot, but I <laughs> I was winning, winning uh, credit union art competitions at a very young age. My mom was involved in them for a very young time. So she, mm. or for your early time as doing on the voluntary board stuff. And yes. they had this national competition and I won loads of trophies with it. So that she kind of got the impression I was pretty good at what I was doing. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that's where it started. It was like, you know, the pre-Texaco children's art competition kind of stuff. That sort yes. of yeah genre of uh, things so yeah. yeah so that's where it kind of all started and then I went to Galway I did my first degree in Galway in GMIT which is now called ATU because they keep on rebranding all their names and I keep on they do, don't they? Yeah, yeah it's really hard to figure it out Crazy. and then I did I went and did some additional courses in engineering afterwards and then I went on to do my master's in Dublin and IADT, which was run out of Temple Bar Gallery and Studios. It was called the Mavis course. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was like a, a course in art writing, art practice and critical, critical and curatorial practice as well. Mm. And critical mm. writing mm. and curatorial practice. Yeah. And yeah. Tell, tell me, Aideen, how would you describe yourself as an artist in terms of the genre that you work in? So it's I work in um, a multitude of media. Mm. So so I'm a mixed media artist. But I'm a socio-political artist in that I make work that comments about the way we live and the world we live in. So I would be a conceptual uh, uh, artist that work that makes socio-political content of worth work. Mm. So that's what I, I try and do. And I, I'd go about that in a number of different kind of strata. So that's how I would describe myself. I know that's a big, long-winded thing, but... I kind of feel art is a really interesting language to be able to talk about really difficult subject matter. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I quite like the ability to do things like that. <laughs> so. And do you have any particular area that you like to concentrate from a social point of view? Othering is a really bittering? good. Othering. So, Othering. So what I'm very interested in is, is the world has been set up by white men. And they have been the dominance in the world, whether they've been colonists or they've been people who've created these hierarchies, patriarchy. And because of that, there are people of color, there are women, there are people with disabilities who have never enjoyed the same privileges. So a lot of my work is about like working either with these kind of communities, anybody who has been othered, or it's about commenting about being less than or not seen as being an equal to. Mm. So that's kind of where I kind of uh, look at in, in the practice. Okay, okay. Now, um, usually at this point I say, can we look around your studio? <laughs> not gonna be I've, much. I've, learned, I've learned to maybe not ask you that. <laughs> because it's actually quite small, isn't it? And there's not a lot happening there. I mean, it's, a, it's about a 12 foot by 12 foot box with a 40 yeah. foot tall ceiling. So that's what I have here. When, the lighting have, good? <laughs> the lighting is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it allowed me to black it out so I could do this projection thing yeah. that I'm working on in the background. Yes. Uh, and the view is so grim. I look out on a strip club in the middle of an Oh, can we have a look? If I take this, I'm afraid if I take this up, I'm afraid and I, I will have to pull all the blinds back and everything. So. Okay. Oh, I'll send you yes, a I'll... photograph. You're more than welcome. Oh, no, I'm not that desperate. <laughs> <laughs> it just looks like like a, an industrial state on the ring road of the M50, but it also happens to have a strip club right outside the front door. So, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> An industrial look. <laughs> Very industrial, with these huge trucks going past every single day. Really? But I do kind of like it because it's like a space of production. Like mm. all around here, there are all of these, you know, working class communities who are making you know, boxes for cars or trucks or they're welding bits and pieces together. So it has a bit of a good feel if you're an artist, you know, like there's yeah. a space where things are getting made and built. So I quite like that. Lovely. <laughs> so, yeah. Lovely. OK. Um, the, the other thing is I, I uh, when we move on to looking at people's work or artists work, um, I generally am in control of the, the PowerPoint, you know, Oh yeah, and no, I'm sorry. The but... minute I saw your stuff when we had our little pre-interview, <laughs> I said, "Right, I think I'll leave you with that." So I made her co-host, and uh, you're yeah, going to take yeah. the running on this. 
Sorry about that, Alan. No, no, not at all. And I think we should I get really, straight uh, into it. I'm one of those high maintenance guests. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Absolutely not. On, on the contrary, because you're going to be doing all the work now. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll try. Well, and what I'm going to ask everybody is make use of the chat box function. So if you have any questions, and I'm really sorry for those people who've seen me speak before. I hope this isn't going to be boring for you. I am going to try and juice it up a bit by adding some new work in here. So you get an understanding of what I'm working on now. So um, the way I often describe myself is a goth. You can tell by the way I look. But this is because I'm very interested and got very interested in gothic culture quite early on. Mm -hmm. As a young person, I got really into the music and everything like that, but then I kind of percolated into my very early works. But when I come away and I go and teach anywhere else, I tell people, us Irish, we own the Gothic. If you look at our literary canon, like from Mary Shelley to Joseph Sheridan Lafanau to Bram Stoker to uh, even Edgar Allan Poe, there's an Irish connection, a familial Irish connection through everything, whether they're actually from here or maybe their grandparents, like Poe's grandparents were from Cavan. And it's something to do with our psychology, our language and our lingualism, yes. that this Gothic kind of percolates us. So that's always something that, and just to show you a few early images, this is really fast going through some images of my early performance work was really obvious mm -hmm. that it was always this kind of aesthetic that I was interested in. But in reality, my life was a bit chaotic. Uh, I was making a lot of work straight out of my first degree in GMIT, but I was also, I had, had had a baby at 21 um, because uh, if you got pregnant, you had no choice in mm -hmm. Ireland in around 2000. So in 2000, I had a baby. I was a single parent. And I was living in what we call Celtic Tiger suburbia, because that was the only place that would take welfare payments for people who were single parents. Mm. And I ended up here and that's where I based my practice. And one, what happened was I desperately tried to fit in with my community. Uh, as a single parent, I was in a kind of a starter home street. So everybody was getting their mortgages were overextended with all this sort of thing and they all ended up here and I was the only one in there on welfare so I kind of did not really fit in but when I tell people about what Ireland looks like they have this image of Ireland which is correct but they don't understand this image of Ireland mm -hmm. where we currently have even though we're going through a massive housing crisis we have 250,000 Celtic Tiger houses that were abandoned after the economic crash. And if you were to look at the kind of Gothic canon, you would say that these are our modern houses of Usher. They, although they were even, are even more tragic for they will never have ghosts live in them because they have been abandoned. And we built these all over the country. And that was the only place you could actually get like a uh, half payment to be able to live in one of these. The yes. time so I lived here and I started making work on social welfare. One day I was trying to like fit in. They used to have this like best window box display competition on the street uh, to try and, and things like that. And they'd have I'd also have like social workers calling in, inspecting to make sure I was a suitable mother to, so that I could retain ownership of my own child. All of these things were happening in 2000. It's changed a lot since, but this was the case. Um, um, and it's because we grew up in a theocracy. This is this kind of um, what has happened in Ireland in particular. But I one day I was like up all night cleaning, trying to fit in, worried about a social welfare inspector coming. I was really anxious all the time. And one day I was looking at the window and I saw my neighbour, Angela, from number 43 River Oaks, and she was vacuuming outside the front of her house. And I realized that every woman in the estate was living on eggshells or living on tender hooks, walking on eggshells, just like I was trying to fit in. So I thought this is where the real Gothic is. And so I started making these very early kind of called performative films. And what it is, is I spent seven days jumping while doing my housework all around the housing estate of River Oaks. And I built this device, um, like uh, it's called a lunchbox, uh, off a computer, put it in a trolley, 
and got my new partner at this time, Cahill, to push it all around so that I could capture myself in mid-air jumping while creating this effortless looking performance to camera. So just hmm. to give an example, to create moving image, you'd need a minimum of 12 photographs to give you one second yes. of moving image. So hmm. this took thousands and thousands of jumps, a physical thing. And all my neighbors saw me going one, two, three, jump, one, two, three, jump, one, two, three, jump. And they thought I was so fucking crazy when they saw me doing this. So they never really saw what I ended up doing. So I start. I thought this is the, the space of making art. Yes. So, um, this and piece, Adrian, uh, yeah. do, do, do you do your own editing? Oh, I do everything myself. Everything. I do the editing. Now it's changed in yeah. recent years. Now I'm, I'm directing feature films. So yes. now I'm working with teams. But at the time, like, I, there was no money in art. There was no funding. There was nothing. So I was making all this stuff myself. Um, yeah. The one thing I would say is the music in the background that you hear, I did get my partner was a percussionist in the symphony orchestra. He, he's still my partner. He's no longer the percussionist in the symphony orchestra. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, he, I asked him, would he make a piece of music to, mm. to this? So he has the musical credit for this. He actually, on the timpani, he yeah. created a, almost like a silent movie thing. He responded to what he saw. Yes. So, so I, I do, he's my longest collaborator, Cahill Murphy. Uh, which, uh, so that's how I did but everything else like all the edit all the color grading all that that's all myself sewing it all together but yeah. it ended up being a kind of a successful piece and uh, it was picked up by Sean Kassan and Emma and it was shown at the Loop Biennale in Spain mm -hmm. and things started changing for me after that suddenly I was getting these kind of international commissions and things and then I was thinking okay now is the time to apply to the Arts Council to bring the project to a larger, more substantial thing. So a personal back note to all of this is, this is my first cousin, Brida, Brida O'Callaghan Hay. She mm -hmm. babysat me in Cork in the 1980s. And she was the first Barry to go to university. So she was a really interesting icon for me in my family to watch this woman progress. And, uh, she was actually, she left Cork in 89 and she joined NASA. Uh, they were hoping to keep her in UCC. She got an honorary PhD for her master's thesis, but because uh, she she's very gifted in mathematics and physics. Um, but at the time, those of you who may remember the 1980s and remember Reagan as the president, he had this thing called the Star Wars program. Have you ever That's heard right. of it? Yeah. 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 The NASA's militarization in the, in the Cold War at the time, but it was the first time it offered non-American scientists the opportunity to join their NASA program. So she was selected and actually ended up being shortlisted a number of times to, she, like, she became a pilot and everything, um, and she was selected a number of times to Captain Endeavor or Discovery in the NASA program. There's a whole article here about her. But if I were to ask any of you, if you have ever heard of my cousin, what would your answer be? No, no probably not. Probably Do you know not. why that is? Is because there's a little thing, an article in our constitution that says article 41.2.3, mm -hmm. a woman's place is in the home. And that affects the way that we recognize women's contributions outside of like this hegemony or this understanding of the structure. So I thought this is kind of funny. This is, well, my, my cousin's invisible. I'm going to make a project kind of inspired by her to try to shine a light a little bit on, on her achievements. Yes. And so I proposed to NASA and to the Arts Council of Ireland to help me beat my cousin in the race for space and to train to become an astronaut and to shoot films in zero gravity. And they accepted me on this program in 2008. And I trained to be an astronaut along with Chris Hurley of the Cork Film Center. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he came out to be my DOP as I trained. So this is me in zero gravity. Check out the hair. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that must have been serious fun, was it? Oh, it was great fun. Poor yeah. Chris, I think, was totally uh, strung out watching it all though because he was trying to film me experiencing zero gravity at the same time it was really stressful for him god love him but uh how, how long does it last is it a couple of minutes it's only a couple of seconds they do this thing it's called uh, it's a 
it's a parabolic flight so they yep. go much higher up than conventional airplanes and they do this thing called on the ball so they mm. basically turn the engine off and then they point the plane down and it's hurtling towards the earth and mm. while it's hurtling or on the ball you experience zero gravity for about eight to 10 seconds so yeah. it gives you the understanding and then you face all the g-force as it comes back the other way so you're like yeah. oh, this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> you so, haven't got a photograph of that have you <laughs> oh i do they, they, they the, the 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 company took the most amazing photographs i should put them in there actually it looks <laughs> gross altogether <laughs> I can imagine i can imagine but, uh, the, but the, the thing I was kind of interested in is like the relationship between othering and within NASA as well. I mean, like they only take superhumans yes. and now they're actually it's really interesting because the Irish um, uh, disability advocate Sinead Burke is going over there to advise them about how they can select uh, people with disabilities uh, mm -hmm. for their. And so she's just, she's working with NASA at the moment. So they've changed completely somewhat. Well, from, hell of a lot has changed, I, it? Yeah, so much. But anyway, while I was there, I was very interested in the domestic and the plan was to shoot this film called Vacuuming in a Vacuum. Do you get it? Mm, I got and it. Then, <laughs> and uh, then I was also looking at like stock footage. This is how um, astronauts wash themselves in space with domestic vacuum cleaners. They mm -hmm. can't use water. And uh, I was also reading Flann O'Brien's Third Policeman a lot of the time. And then Flann O'Brien was very much influenced by Brian O'Nolan, or not Brian O'Nolan, right? Flann O'Brien is Brian O'Nolan, but by Schrodinger, who he had this kind of tete-a-tete -tete with while Schrodinger was in teaching in UCD, they would have arguments with each other. And he went on to influence his, this idea of molecular transference that you read within the text of third police which I highly recommend everybody should read it's one of the funniest books ever yes. and I was thinking about on a molecular level if we were enshrined in objects to continue will we become half human half domestic cleaning spray or cleaner and so I created this whole body of work where I'd become half human half vacuum cleaner like a kind of a mollusk mollusks floating about in zero gravity Yes. And then this was all shown as part of uh, futures in the RHA, uh, which and then started kicking off this relationship with the Royal Hibernian Acad Academy. So hmm. this was kind of how it was shown. And then I also turned the tables on you, the viewer, when you're experiencing the work. And I designed these wall mounted viewing devices where you had to become half human, half object to experience the films. So it was kind of like turning the tables a bit. Mm hmm. Someone you love could be carrying cold. I, I often show this ad to try and talk about the subtle sexism that exists in our world. Like, yeah. for example, you know, the, the ploys that are used within this is, are what Freud calls cognitive dissonance, where you're attracted and repelled at the same time. Um, but it also talks about, like, you're a bad mother, you've exposed your child to all of these unseen germs. Be a good mother, buy the chemical, clean it up. Now, every time I show this ad, we've lived through a different moment. So we've just lived through the pandemic and we all realize we need the fecking cleaning sprays. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone. While I was in NASA in 2008, um, George Bush was now the president and he was looking for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was his justification for invading these well, in particular, the Iraqi war. Yeah. And it turned out they didn't fecking exist. But no. while I was in NASA, everybody was like really suspicious. Like, why is there this Irish woman artist doing the space program? And what are you doing here? I was asked questions. And I thought, I'm going to like kind of look at this idea of fear of othering. And so I created these drawings for my weapons of mass consumption. So this is these are my spray grenades. So I'm bastardizing this language of fear and othering, and I'm turning it into these kind of potent kind of semiotics within my work. So these are my spray grenades. So this is the domestic cleaning spray version. And then I like I bastardized the domestic dis the cleaning display object with with a weapon. So this is my spray grenade. And then I hold made a whole arsenal. Um and uh, then I went on to make this larger one, which was kind of designed around a spore, like a, a virus spore, but also the detonators were modeled on Mr. Sheen cleaning spray de um, things. And this is just an idea of what that looked like. 
And it's an idea of the scale of what that looks like in reality, which is yeah. this huge sculpture piece that was huge. shown at the Ring and Tannery. And this what materials the are you using? Sorry? What material are you using? It's, it's all the materiality of, of NASA. So it's aluminium, brass, and steel. These are all the materials that they use within their objects or their design things. And somebody mentioned that they, my work is in Balana. One of the editions of the spray grenades is in Balana. So, so yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the piece. It's a public art project that's there. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, uh, th and this is what it looked like in RHA. And like I often show my drawings along with this. But um, so I'm just going to go on a little bit. So I came back from NASA. It's 2008. The entire country is bankrupt in the metrics that are created by the World Health Organization. Art is, Ireland is bottom of the table for mental health. Houses are being repossessed at an enormous uh, case. They, like everybody has invested in property and um, we have the highest suicide rates in Europe. It was a disastrous time. Mm. And I was reading a, a lyric from our greatest soothsayer, uh, our Cassandra, the most malign philosopher we've ever created, Sinead O'Connor, mm. who said, we are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder since the famine, hence our relationship with property ownership. And I think she's absolutely spot on. Like other Europeans don't have the same obsession about property ownership like we do. No, they and don't. I, no. Yeah, we totally put all our eggs into this one basket. And I so I get the use uh, for six months of an abandoned housing estate in Tune, where there's only four houses occupied, and uh, I think there's over a thousand of them in various states of build. And I make this film, this performative film called Possession where I'm playing on this world, a word of uh, our language of horror. So this is me moving the camera along one door at a time to give you an idea of the scale of these abandoned houses. They're all different houses. In They're the all different place. houses. Good God, I thought they were the same one. Yeah. No, it's not the same house. It's cookie cutter yeah. housing estate Jesus. Yeah. in Tune. And uh, then there's a protagonist and the protagonists manifest these bizarre behaviors from living in this housing estate, like eating disorders, which Ireland is the worst in the table of eating disorders in Europe. Uh, so, and I too was equally possessed in making this film because I had to be in two places at the same time. I call these, sorry, So I call these films performative films because I have to figure out the kind of being in front of and behind the camera. And often I'm reliant on my partner to climb up onto a building and hold onto the camera. Well, I have to take the photograph where I'm lying down on the ground, remote control in my mouth going click or he, I tell him, take the photo, click. And he takes the photo and I get back up and I put, put myself out of the picture, bring the lawnmower in, cut half a foot. Um, lie back down again in the same position, moving the scissors half an inch, take the photograph, click. So that's why this takes six months to make, this yeah. illusion, this visual fiction, that things are effortlessly done. So this is this film, this possession. And uh, I'm using a lot of what kind of Beckett did with this kind of slapstick humor. Like everybody mm. wanted these garages, right? Nobody puts their cars in them. They just fill them all with their Ikea shit. But we still need our um, sliced bread in the morning, you know, because we are still like basic within these kind of needs. So I kind of merge the banality of the two together to create this um, slapstick situation. Yeah. Now, in reality, like I, we don't have remote control garage doors. I had the remote. We know this uh, in Americana, but we don't have this in Ireland because we're too poor. So I bring the, the door of the garage door down a bit, get a bread knife, cut it another bit, take a photograph, bring the door down another bit, get the bread knife, cut the bread another bit, bring the door down, take a photograph. So it's like this like ritual to create this demanding over the top slapstick. Slap it's brilliant, up. absolutely brilliant. So this is actually in the Arts Council of Ireland's collection. 
Mm -hmm. so if you curate or anything like that, you can ask the Arts Council for use of this film in a yes in a show or something like that. Uh -huh. So and uh, so now I'm going to ask you, for example, in this next sequence of the film, how did the chair go into the ground? I see somebody has a question in the chat box here. You got a saw and you bit by bit cut the legs. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I cut it off one inch at a time. Or millimeters, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A millimeter, exactly, to yeah. be metric. And I uh, reversed the footage and that's how I did it. And that's the same with, say, the vacuum cleaner. You can see I'm a bit of an obsession with vacuum cleaners. Mm. Um, but I mean, like, I'm talking to you now today, right, from New York. It's 2023. In our constitution is still this article that enshrines women's place to the home. Things haven't changed enough back home in Ireland where your gender enshrines you into these certain objects of domesticity. So, um, like, it, it's, it's funny how this, this work has had a long life because it has been shown in so many socio-political contexts or curatorial contexts where I'm kind of commenting a little bit about this. Yes. Anyway, so, okay, on to the next one. All right, so... I mean, 18. Yeah. Is, isn't it odd that in, in a country that sort of pioneered same-sex marriage and everything else relative yeah. to other countries, that we actually still have that paragraph or clause of the Constitution? Well, our, our Citizens' Assembly has actively advocated that we remove it. But oh, really? uh, it, the problem is that we keep on electing right-wing governments who want to ignore like human rights. So unless we start electing different types of, mm. of political representation that actually uh, has respect for for humanity, not based on gender or discrimination. And we're not going to get much change until yeah. we actually have something like that. So, uh, yeah. um, but then anyway, don't ask me a political question. <laughs> no, no, but I'm, I'm not. That's wrong. not my job either. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> actually, in in all of the things that you see, you know, like uh, marriage equality, women's bodily autonomy, it's been the Citizens mm. Assembly, which has been a made up of a cohort of a hundred different citizens every time and they've each advocated for a radical shift in our constitution so mm -hmm. i i just think that's been one of the most radical political things we've ever done but anyway um somebody has asked a question here i just want to make sure that i uh thank you yvonne yvonne has said i have a brilliant creative imagination and so academic and articulate too oh my god i can't believe you think that i'm really not articulate well anyway thank you um i so will i will i show you some more Please, of yeah. the work and our, yeah. our, and then i'll move on to very quickly the two new projects that i've just recently done sure. so i'll just uh, the remote control thing became this whole part of my practice like if you're remotely controlled where you should be in the world then you kind of use this to kind of poke fun at things so I was approached by this gallery that I was working with called Mother's Tank Station in Dublin. They asked if I would do something for an art fair, which is associated with Art Basel in Switzerland. And they'd heard that I'd done this project in NASA and they said, could you do something around flight or zero gravity? And so I thought, I wonder how many remote control helicopters it would take to lift me off the ground. And given, give or take a, a diet, it would cost thousands to buy the thousands of tiny remote control helicopters to do it. Mm. So I thought, okay, let's just try with 20 <laughs> and see yeah. if I could do something. And yes. I went to a group of lads down the country called the Remote Control Flying Club of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, could this be done? And they said, no. And I was like, this is not true. So I went away and I worked with a guy called Gordon Ryan and I watched hours and hours of YouTube video to figure out this process called trimming mm, and I yes. created this piece called flight volley and I performed it and the dress is made in the design of the Marilyn Monroe dress uh, which is kind of a deliberate thing and it's also designed out of a World War II parachute and it was kind of rooted in the history of our art fairs because that's where I was going to perform it where they come from the world fair tradition that's where they the root of them is and at the world fairs you would read about demonstrations in early flight so the wright brothers would have launched their first plane there would have been hot air balloons uh, crashing spectacularly and all the sorts of things so this flight folly came into position so anyway despite the lads telling me i couldn't do it i did it 
-hmm. I performed it in um, in uh, Switzerland, and then I again I was invited back to perform it in uh, Mother's Tank Station in Dublin in 2011 on April Fool's Day. And I went and I showed the lads from the Road Control Flying Club, and they made me the 2012 poster girl for the. <laughs> really? Director. I'll just show you a little clip of what that looks like. Oh yeah, good. Yes. That's me holding the remote in the center. Yeah. You're yeah. controlling every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I am. I learned how to do it. <laughs> yeah. That's fabulous. That's all I'm going to show you of it because I really think you need to see the performance to get yeah, the idea yeah, what actually yeah. happened. So, um, okay, so um, what will I show you next? I think what I'm going to show you next is so you've seen these kind of performative films <clears throat> that I've been making. Yes. So I did a whole project in. Um, uh, Am I all right for time, Alan? I'm not going mad. Anymore. No, I was just looking at that because I it's, yes. a quarter, it's a quarter to now. So I'd like to leave about 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions. So maybe another five minutes. Okay, so I'll quickly we'll open two it last out. projects and then I will shut up, okay? Because I'm sorry no if I... If I no, no, if no, I talk, no, no, no. I talk for Ireland. <laughs> but this is great. This is wonderful. Okay, I'll tell you my two most recent huge projects. So in uh, 2017, I gave a paper, an academic paper on my work with working with communities to make co-created works uh, in Pesh in Hungary and Pesh had been the European capital of culture. So it was organized by the European Union. And in the audience were two of the curators from CONUS 2022 which was going to be the European capital of culture in 2022. I had never heard of CONUS I'm really embarrassed to say if there are any uh, Lithuanians in your audience, I'm very sorry. I didn't know. Well, I know because Ryanair fly there. Exactly. They fly <laughs> to Konas direct and Vilnius too. Yes, that's right. Um, but when I arrived in Konas, I couldn't believe because they invited me to come and see their city. And I was like, oh, my God, it's amazing. It's so beautiful. It's like this Art Deco wonder creamer. It's just amazing. And I was really embarrassed. I hadn't heard of it. And it turns out Konus was the capital of Lithuania. What happened was when the Romanov dynasty died, it, um, the, it, the Lithuania got independence in 1916, 1917, but it lost its capital, Vilnius. It was still part of Poland, effectively. All right. And uh, so they had to build the infrastructure of a European capital in 20 years. So from 1919 to 1939, they're, they're, the citizens architects created this beautiful, what we call Art Deco. They would call interwar modernism. And all of their architects studied under Corbusier, for example. Mm -hmm. And so they made this beautiful city. You wander around, your mouth is agog the whole time. It's just extraordinary. But what happened was in 1939, the Nazis invaded and aided by the Lithuanians themselves, they killed every single Jewish citizen in the city. And most of the architects were Jews. Mm. And then four years later, the Soviets moved into the city and they rounded up anybody who was like you or I, an artist, a creative, an academic, and put them on trains to Siberia, to gulags, and they were killed. Yeah. So the city lost its creative gene and mm. all these citizens from all over the USSR were moved <clears> and then they were under Soviet occupation until 1991 when they got independence again mm. and then they joined the European Union in 2005 and now they have spent nearly 20 years trying to save these buildings and they're trying to get UNESCO World Heritage status but the citizens have a real ambivalence to this architecture and they're knocking it down because it's associated with trauma exactly. as yeah. exactly what we did in Ireland with our Georgian buildings it's associated yes. with colonization so they asked me could I make a film with a couple of their citizens to get them to fall in love with it so off I went and I started showing them filmmaking techniques of that time between 19 and 1919 and 1939 and then I was going to make this film with maybe 200 citizens uh, and, the, and their interiors are just gorgeous. You just wouldn't believe yes. what you see there. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. But then it was 2020 and I ended up stuck in the country and had to get emergency diplomatic flight out of there because the pandemic happened. Yeah. 
-hmm. So I had to figure out how to teach everybody stop motion animation techniques and get them to be involved in this project from my home. So I ended up teaching nearly 3000 people in these workshops on stop motion animation from my kitchen in Tipperary. All via Zoom. All via Zoom. That's why I'm Fantastic. so fluent in this. <laughs> Fantastic. So, and then I started showing yeah. them, this is Oscar Schneidermeyer's amazing Bauhaus ballet. And I showed them how we could interpret the modernism in a different way, like a performative thing. So we went and I asked them, they were like us, we were restricted to a five kilometer radius. I asked them to choose their favorite buildings and we're going to turn them into these performative costumes to wear an, an imaginary online ballet. So these all came from the workshops. And then we made these animations together all via Zoom of these stop motion animations. I know I'm, going, I'm flying through this really fast. Yeah, no, don't worry. That's great. I'm just going to show you this. So these are all, then the kids then made these costumes, which were just so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, all out of cardboard, all from from school or lockdown. But that inspired, I was then approached by Conus 2022. Could we turn the costumes to be worn by the by the ballet company, our dance theatre to be performed at the opening ceremony? So that was performed. They, these costumes were made from our workshops and were performed to 2.5 million Europeans at the launch of the European Capital of Culture. Mm -hmm. And so and then we were we turned our, our animations that we were all making into these video mapped projections in downtown Conus all over the building. Sorry, I went too fast there. Yeah. These were all over the buildings in Conus for the launch of the European Capital of Culture. This all came from the workshops all projection mapped everywhere and then i asked them i said what's the one thing that unites all classes in lithuania what's the one tv program that everybody sits down to watch together and they told me it was the great british bake-off <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> and i said oh this is oh. so funny let's make our own cake so i asked these amazing i suppose they're like um artisan uh it's an artisan school. Bakers. They're teaching, say, early school leavers, for example, <clears throat> to be professional practice pathways in the culinary arts. Mm -hmm. So we got them to make the six, six cakes that were going to be chapter points in our film. And this ended up becoming this other viral thing because all these TV stations came along to see what we were doing. And our the cake in the top right and corner here ended up in the Guinness World Book of Re Records as the largest modernist cake ever made. So this all came from the workshops and then this became this art film Clustus. Yeah. And Clustus is the Lithuanian for pleats or folds. Mm -hmm. So we also did a whole series of workshops with um, a filmmaker Strang at the Talent. So we had a thousand, nearly a thousand volunteers became a part of this project. They became the actors, they made, they gave me the buildings, they mm -hmm. made the props. And so this is the film Clusters. I'm going to quickly show this trailer. Do please, it's, yeah. Uh, touring film festivals in the world right now. This is Clostus. It um, got premiered in Ireland at the Galway Film Flat. It got premiered in the UK at the London Festival of Architecture. It's currently being shown in Vesprim, which is the European capital culture in, in Hungary this year. It's going to be shown here in New York in the American Filmmakers Co-op, uh, co mm -hmm. who it's traveling everywhere at the moment. And if anybody would like to, a private link to see it, just email me afterwards and I'm very happy. Uh, and access the passcode, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, the last thing I'm going to speak about is the biggest project I'm working on right now. Um, am I all right, Alan? You um, are, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
So I, I'm really sorry, everybody. I've spoken a hundred miles an hour, and my real apologies for that. And uh, you, you just you can't leave anything out. It's so bloody good. <laughs> Thanks. You're very nice to say that. But I, yeah, the last project that I'm working on has been um, another project that was going on in tandem to Clostus. So I was commissioned by the Irish Traditional Music Archive and Music Network for this project. Now, the big question I have, and I'm going to ask it even in this room here with all of you artists today, is the question, what if we are the last of the artists? What if we are the last generation of artists? What do you do if that is the case? And that's the thing that I, I am asking of this project. So what happened was, I was approached to talk, uh, to re respond to the Bunting archives. And maybe some of you are aware of the Bunting archives. They, they are in Queen's University in Belfast. What happened was Irish traditional harp was ubiquitous in the 15th century, in the medieval period, it was everywhere. It was like a part of our language and our spoken word tradition. So the bardic poets, which would tell the tales of the Tua de Danon and Deirdre August Gwainia and all of that, they would travel around Ireland and beyond into Europe and they would be accompanied by a harpist who would be like the beat poet. Who they would kind of inflect or add to the way the story or the tale or the poem would be told. But this awful fucking bitch called Queen Elizabeth I set about to eradicate Irish culture through the plantations. And she wrote a royal edict that Irish harp was outlawed and banned. And it, she's recorded in a court saying, Irish harpists should be strung from the very trees by the strings that they play. So she hated Irish harp music. And so this edict unfortunately affected the tr future of Irish harp. So by the 18th century, there were only 11 harpers left. And in the same way, like our oral tradition, it hadn't really been written down. So what happened was it was, there was only, they were all in the six, their sixties. Most of the harpers were blind. It was kind of this thing to choose a blind child to become a harper so they wouldn't become, de or to become so they wouldn't become destitute because of their disability. Yes. So uh, it's kind of an unusual tradition. So mm -hmm. um, Turlock O'Carolan, who is our Mozart effectively, he was very famous because he was a blind harpist and he was a blind fiddle player. He wrote every kind of music or he created all sorts of music. He was just an extraordinary person. He lost his sight during the smallpox uh, uh, epidemic. Mm -hmm. But this, what happened was in 1796, the Belfast Harp Festival, this incredible young man called Edward Bunting, he was only 19, he was a musicologist, so not from our tradition, he, he wrote down the last remaining lilts and airs of Irish harp. And it's kind of amazing that he did this because he saved Irish harp. So the image here on the right of this uh, slide is his writings of Turlock O'Carlin's The Lamentations of Owen Roe O'Neill and tells the story of the flight of the, of the earls and all mm -hmm. of the story of Owen and like he's a he's a he's a musical musicologist so he doesn't write down how they're being played the timings or the tempo so because of that gap in what he did write down every single harpist that plays these pieces of music or any of the music from the tradition from the archive they interpret it in their own way so nobody plays it exactly the same no harpist sounds the same as the other hmm. anyway so i thought i was so inspired by this young person's endeavor to save an art form, what he did, that I thought this is a larger question to ask. And I'm really curious about other people who are the contemporary buntings of our time. So I approached this incredible Irish, contemporary Irish harper uh, called Ashling Lyons. And I asked her, would she work with me? And we reinterpret from the archives one of Turlock O'Carolan's errors called The Lamentations of Owen Roe O'Neill. And I then approached an Inuit throat singer called Reet. Who lives who's uh she's Inuit she's from the Arctic Circle and she is bringing back Inuit throat singing by by merging it with pop music now Inuit throat singing was banned in Canada up until the 1980s was it yeah and not many people know that and mm. actually it was outlawed by what we exported over there which was religious orders and missionaries they saw it as the devil's work so unfortunately 
and they did some awful damage to the Inuit uh, in particular. And then I approached an amazing Milner and conceptual artist called Margaret O'Connor because I wanted to see, you know, I looked at like what did the, the bardic poets look like and how did the, and the observations of the Harpers in Bunting's own writings. And so we created a kind of a apocalyptic pop song I worked with the incredible composer Steve Shannon and my partner Cahill Murphy as well, who's classically trained to construct mm -hmm. this um, 15 minute apocalyptic pop song that was presented in this four channel video installation, um, which was shown in Centre Culturel Irlandais in Paris. It had its debut in Limerick City Gallery, it went to Source Art Centre, it went to Cavan Town Hall. Um, it's going to go elsewhere. I can't say any more than that. Mm. Um, and I'm just going to show you, it's also been shown in this incredible endeavor in Dublin called The Living Canvas, which is Europe's largest outdoor screen for public video art. So I'm just going to play a trailer of this and then I'll end it on Do after please, that. Yeah. <laughs> And that is Oblivion. And uh, mm. uh, the other thing about it is we got it uh, pressed into, where am I going here? We got it pressed into this red vinyl record, mm -hmm. which comes with the limited edition print, which is available to buy on my website. Hint, hint, people. <laughs> um, but the proceeds, the entire proceeds of this uh, artwork are going to plant up this poisoned land that I live in in Tipperary, which was poisoned by um, the silver. By, yeah, it was actually, it was the mining. There was an, yeah. a Canadian mining firm came in and they strip mined the silver mines and mm -hmm. they used cyanide to blast into get the ore out. Mm -hmm. And so they poisoned our water table and the entire valley, the European Union had to come in and bring in 300 trillion tons of topsoil all over the valley because of the cancer rates caused by the dust that was blowing around in the 80s and 90s. This is one of the reasons I think I'm, I'm, we are the last of the artists, but we're offsetting the entire carbon footprint of the project. We have eight acres of land and we're planting the entire land up with the native tree species to try and undo some of the damage that's been done by the heavy metals. So we just planted nearly uh, 290 trees this year and uh, that's just been from the proceeds of the Oblivion records because the last thing I want to do as an artist is make more stuff and contribute to the de degradation of our environment so I'm trying to do that. so that's Oblivion and that's where I'm going to end it today and thank you so much I hope this has been helpful no, it's been fascinating it's <laughs> thank been you Thanks. so if you just unshare there and we can yeah, see I'm yeah. stopping <clears throat> the share now I, I, uh, Anyway, that I, was superb absolutely thanks. superb I have thanks. to tell you <clears throat> excuse me um, I'm indebted to Mary Pavlides, who's the chair of the Contemporary Irish Arts Society, who I doorstopped at, at, at an exhibition. Um, it was in the Taylor Galleries, Tim Goulding's exhibition. And I know Mary, right? But I, I sort of said to her, I said, Mary, look, can you tell me of somebody I probably don't know who is the hottest thing in the art world? 
coming. <laughs> and we're looking at you. <laughs> No, I'm not the hottest thing. Well, God. the hottest is probably not the right word to use. But <laughs> talented and and, oh. and extraordinary, and uh, you know, I, I'm 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 so pleased she actually introduced us because you are an extraordinary woman, and oh, I think your your work is is amazing. And to be honest, with you, I, I don't know how you achieve so much because you're a master of collaboration. I'm very lucky. It's all about the people I end up working with. Yeah. That's the thing, really. I mean, you could just, I mean, they bring such rich, richness. And I've had amazing collaborations. So, like, I collaborated with one of my heroes, Alice Maher, a couple of years ago. We made a film together. Uh, I've collaborated with Junk Ensemble. I'm working on a pro project with uh, Jesse Jones, Irene Buckley, Amanda Coogan, Junk, and... God, there's a whole cohort and Alwyn Flurry at the moment and that's just so exciting that's going to be in the RHA as part of Dublin Dance yes. Theatre I think it's just I suppose uh, this they're all great opportunities to work with geniuses so that's mm -hmm. you know you don't say no to that you know mm -hmm. and when I went to CONUS like I didn't know I was going to meet some extraordinary people who were just going to be so generous with their talents you know and uh, and their time and their commitment yeah and they and made how, how exactly do you, do you end up interfacing with these sort of people i mean you know they just don't come by accident door. <laughs> yeah, ah, go on now. come on be a little well, more look, I, I mean if i hadn't <laughs> gone to pesh in hungary yeah i wouldn't have met the curators conus were in the audience and i would never have thought at an academic conference mm. that i would meet people who'd be interested in programming me i mean and the budget for that film i think i was telling you alan like it was 150 to 160 thousand euros was the largest budget i've ever been given on a project and that's by a country lithuania is only 3.5 million ireland is 6 million on the island of ireland and uh, so i got more funding for that for for that project in Lithuania than I've ever gotten in Ireland. So mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a shame that that's the case, but that we yeah. spend the lowest amount on visual culture in Europe. Um, but uh, fact, yeah. yeah, our GDP spend is, is the lowest in Europe. Good it's it's okay. shocking. Yeah, shocking. There are lessons to be learned. But, uh, so how, do, how does it all happen? Um, I just never say no. <laughs> say yes to everything. And I just yeah. go with the roller coaster ride. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Mary is so good. Please tell her I said thank you. She's been a great supporter of mine. So she's I, great. I think she's, well, I'm sure she's probably on this. Um, do you know there's so many messages? Can you see anyone's particular okay. like to address? Because oh god, this everybody, I'm really beaming with all your lovely praise. Thank you so much. Really, it's so lovely. I did um put my email address in the chat. So if yeah. anybody would like a link to see these films, I'm really happy to make that happen. Um, somebody asked, as in the 1980s, as in 40 years ago, yes, Anne Hogg, yes, that music was banned, that tradition was banned up until the 1980s. Mm -hmm. That's what colonizers do. Um, would love to show your film to my students. It's absolutely great. I love the mix of modern and traditional techniques. Yeah. And you're a teacher of architecture. So yes, Claudia in Hamburg, I will send you a link very happy to do this and somebody said they were descendant of lithuanian lithuanians here somewhere i saw that come up there that's that's D david goldberg in fact david, yes david yeah. Goldberg, yes yeah 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 so um yeah there i mean lots of people were forced out of lithuania that several like pogroms at several mass exodus they i mean unfortunately they were colonized a number of times in different well, ways They've a lot D of D david's david's um predecessors were from lithuania Wow. And there there are no Jews left in Lithuania at all, other than in a burial ground, a cemetery. Yeah, it's amazing they have yeah. a cemetery actually, because a lot of the cemeteries were destroyed. Yes. Um, okay. Can you see anything else there before I I, I let anyone in? Uh to... Norman McLaren. Oh, I love Norman McLaren. No, uh, Claudia, yes. Oh, so the, the one of the things I was going to say was in the 1980s in Ireland, we were broke and we brought somebody in RTE bought in all these Eastern European and experimental films and they put them on prime time TV hour. So when children were awake, so between like five and seven, they put these films on and I think they thought they were children's TV. So I saw this style of stop motion animation in around 86, 87. I saw Jan Steinmeier, Esther Krombakova, Norman McLaren. And this style affected me because it was kind of political work 
that was using surrealism and stop motion animation. And that's why I was so inspired by that style. So I have brought that style from its origins in the East, from Lithuania mm -hmm. to, to Ireland and then brought it back again with, with um, my recent project. So uh, I love, uh, love that. And that's why I'm like really interested in democratizing the access to visual culture. I know Alan, you and I have talked mm -hmm. about this, like how do you democratize the access to visual art and normalize it as a professional thing? So I recently got to do a, a pro project with on post. I made a series of poisonous stamps that's right. Um, and uh, that was like one of those kind of joyous things to do. And I, I immediately said yes, because the idea that my artwork would be able to go to everybody's home or through the domestic post, I loved the idea of that. And I, I really embrace visual culture, having that kind of um, interface with mm. our, our non-art systems. So anyway, sorry, I went on a mad tangent there, but I hope uh, no, no questions no. here. Somebody has a question here. Yeah. Everybody, uh, you're all so lovely with your praise. You should ask some questions. Interrogate me, people. Do you know, do you know what we're <laughs> going to do? We're going to, we're, yeah. we're going to allow people unmute themselves, but yeah. please only do so if, if you're going to ask a question. But before we do that, I do want to ask, uh, is there an artist that you particularly admire? Yeah, I think I I I think I'm in the city of one of my favorite artists. So Louise Bourgeois, mm -hmm. who was here in the city, and she was kind of rediscovered in her 70s, even mm -hmm. though she was like a, a contemporary of de Kooning and hung out with all of the artists here. Um, but it seems to happen to a lot of female artists, but she's one of my heroes. She, I was supposed to go to one of her salons 12 years ago. Oh, really? And mm. she died just mm. before, when she used to ha open up her home on a Sunday and every, all these artists were allowed to come to her home because she didn't really leave her house. Yeah. And you could talk about your work. And the, she loved Irish people because I think her father was a big fan of the Irish. And if you brought her a bottle of Irish whiskey, apparently she was excellent to you. <laughs> so I heard this from other Irish artists who went to visit her. So I had it all ready to go, all ready yeah. to rock. I was so excited to meet her. I mean, for those of you who don't know who I'm talking about, have you ever seen the giant spider sculptures? So her, that's her mama. It's her mother and the spider, even though it's quite a terrifying structure, it's supposed to be this um, ode to love and her relationship with her caring mother, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, a spider apparently mines its eggs in, an, in a very caring way. And that's why she worked in that scale. And I just loved, loved her, loved her work. And I was so sad never to meet her. Yeah, but I feel I know her through the work, though, Alan. That's what sure, I feel. Sure, yes, yes, you yes. Know? She was quite temperamental, wasn't she? I saw I saw a documentary yeah. about her. But like, wouldn't you be if you'd been forgotten all your life and then you're discovered in your your seventieth decade and uh, rediscovered as an artist? I'd be temperamental too. I'd be fucking furious, you know. <laughs> I know, yeah. You know, so I'd be having, I'd be throwing things on the floor too if I wasn't if I was kind of overlooked because of my gender. Sure. And yeah. she was the best. I think she's the best artist uh the the states ever created even though she's french but uh she's known as an american artist so. I, didn't, I didn't realize that actually i thought she was just pure french and lived in france and all the rest okay listen i've, I've allowed people to unmute themselves so if anyone would like to ask a question in person uh now is your chance okay marianne yeah no just say hello to aideen i met we met up a few times at different yes. art things yes. and you did the sculpture in ballina art center so i see that every week we do live drawing there so, and so, so great great stuff yeah i'm really impressed thank you thank Brilliant. you so much marianne yeah. thank, you. thank you for coming along to all the other talks i really appreciate yeah. thanks yeah and <laughs> Enjoy New York. <laughs> <I will. Thanks. Yeah. laughs> Thanks Thank you, Marianne. Me. Thank okay. you. Uh, Jacques, hey, Jean. over in Canada, would you like to say something? Yes, Bonjour, I would. Jacques. Uh, Bonjour. 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 Um, I, I, I was fascinated with your, 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 your films. Um, I've, I've played a little bit with stop action, and uh, so you may see an email from me uh, okay. sooner than later about some, some with some... Uh, some questions because I've, I've I've found it to be a struggle, uh, and <laughs> and I've really enjoyed doing that stuff. So so thank you, thank I you. I, I mean, I've, I have found 
watching your 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 uh, your videos um, an inspiration to get back to it. So thank you. Fantastic, Jacques. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I have a whole list of software and things like that that I can recommend that I'm happy okay, to I would, I, you. So I'll send you an email sure, for the course. link. Yes. For the link, but also for some of the uh, yes. suggestions you may have. So thank you. Yeah. And I think Norman McLaren is uh, is Quebecois, is he? No. Uh, well, he was uh, he was uh, I think he was out of Montreal. Yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, you can see a lot of his film uh, through the website of the National Film Board of Canada. Ah. Uh, and fantastic. you know some some of his uh, his ballet pieces and yes. uh, and so. Well, just uh, just brilliant. He's a genius. I love the. I think is is it like the one where he has fights with a neighbor and the flower coming up across the two. Uh, okay, I'm not sure about this one, but oh, but I've never fantastic, of yes. fantastic film. It's an amazing film. But yeah, a genius, absolutely. Norman McLaren was an absolute genius. But yeah, I'm really ha happy to answer any questions on stop motion animation, Jack. No problem at all. Well, thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you Thank you all so much for listening to me rabbit on. <laughs> um, I will be back in Ireland in May and then I have a big show in the uh, Salzburg Kunstverein in Austria in June and July that I'm getting prepared for. So uh, I can't tell you uh, the next project I'm doing in Ireland because I think it's a while away yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but, uh, we'll certainly keep in touch, Aideen, yeah. and as soon as you do have anything that um, is in Ireland, we, 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 we'll let people know or indeed wherever. Okay. Um, because you know what you <laughs> you're truly international at this stage oh, aren't you yeah they, they let anyone in anywhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you ask that's the difference <laughs> that's it <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway. there's lots of lessons to be learned there folks i think yes. for, for all you artists yes. um, out there but look thank you so much Aideen. it's thank been a you. real pleasure you and, all uh, have my email addresses yes. in the chat if you have any questions i'm really yeah. happy to answer questions off camera as well okay Goodbye. Very good. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks very much indeed. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.